I have a great deal of respect for academic founders. I've observed over my time in the startup industry that those trained in the scientific method tend to be really good founders and have a really good head on their shoulders. And why? Because the scientific method, if you boil it down to a few sentences, goes thus. I don't know if this will work. Let me go collect some data. Let me make sure that I am completely unbiased and see what that data tells me. And not bring my own expectations, not bring my own biases, just see what the data says. That's how good founders approach the market. I don't know if my product's going to work. I'm going to test it with some customers and it may completely violate my desires and wishes, but that's okay. I'm going to go with it. So the science founders who can make that transition, I find you very, very well as entrepreneurs. Hundreds of thousands of researchers around the world are working to improve life and address imminent threats to humanity. Often their research ends up in the scientific valley of death in the form of publications and patents that never see the light of day. That is about to change. Welcome to the Lab to Startup podcast, hosted by Naresh Sunkara, founder and executive director of the Berkeley Postdoc Entrepreneurship Program at the University of California, Berkeley. This show has two main goals. Share the stories of those who have successfully founded startups based on their own research and highlight resources needed to help those aspiring to launch startups in the deep tech space. Whether it's electric cars, vaccines, addressing climate change concerns, or possibly establishing life on other planets, Naresh and his esteemed guests want to help scientists, engineers, faculty, and researchers bring their innovations to market. Learn more and subscribe today at labtostartup.com. And now, here's Naresh. My guest today is Caroline Winnett, the Executive Director of Berkeley Skydeck, a startup accelerator at the University of California, Berkeley. Skydeck started as a startup mentoring space in 2012 and soon translated into one of the leading startup accelerators in the world. Skydeck was formed as a partnership between UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business, the College of Engineering, and the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research. While it offers all the benefits of a traditional accelerator, what makes Skydeck special is the vast resources of the world's number one ranked public university. The robust and vibrant ecosystem includes a deep network of advisors, industry partners, and attracts some of the best investors as well. I've seen its evolution firsthand because of my own associations in postdoc days at UC Berkeley. We start by discussing the evolution of startup ecosystem at UC Berkeley, and then dive into how Skydeck has been supporting deep tech startups, challenges, and lessons learned. They take in two cohorts of startups every year, and the applications for the next cohort is round the corner. I hope insights from Caroline are helpful for all those considering Berkeley Skydeck. All right, Caroline, welcome to the show. I've known you for a very long time since you've taken the realm of Skydeck a long time ago, and I've seen Skydeck evolve. I think it's a great opportunity to learn many things that I don't know of what happened internally as Skydeck grew. And I know you have been on other podcasts as well. So I'm not going to go on a general subject, but we'll go deep into deep tech because that is the audience that listens to my podcast. So welcome again. Pleasure to be here, Naresh, and great to see you, at least on, on the Zoom. Excellent. Let's start with the big picture. I think building startup ecosystems or accelerators around academic institutions, especially those public universities where the missions are generally around teaching, research, and public service, and not really commercialization of research in general, right? Maybe you can give some background to the startup activity around UC Berkeley pre and after starting Skydeck, and if you can focus on commercializing technologies. That'll be helpful because a lot of the audience are from academia here. Sure. So I will say it's like a different world at UC Berkeley since I started at Skydeck, and that's now nine years ago. Nine years. But Skydeck started a few years before that, but even in my tenure, startup activity has just exploded. It's just been amazing to watch. There's a wonderful, gigantic slide with tons of logos of the startup programs that were on campus 10, 20 years ago and now today, and that's like they won't even fit on the page. So certainly before Skydeck, there were startups coming out of Berkeley, quite well-known ones. But not only has the number increased, but the interest in entrepreneurship, the number of students who want to do startups, 
the number of formal offerings, including the Skydeck program to help educate both entrepreneurs and startups. And now, of course, we've expanded to not just educating and teaching students about entrepreneurship and startups, but actually bringing startups to campus from around the world to participate in our programs, become part of Berkeley. And the Skydeck program has just absolutely grown by orders of magnitude since I started. And we have found, I'm very happy to say, that there's really no conflict between running the Skydeck startup program and being part of our public university and serving that education mission. It just all works together beautifully. And we're just so excited to be on this giant blue wave of startups at UC Berkeley. Yeah, I've seen this change. I was a postdoc when Skydeck first started. And then I've been since then, I've seen the changes. Were there any catalyzing factors? Because there seemed to be that tension before. I think it's seen it at most academic institutions of commercializing and starting companies from universities. Anything that stands out or any reasons for the success? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was definitely a layering factor. So as time went on and more faculty and grad students did startups and they saw each other doing startups, and you were blessed to be in the middle of Silicon Valley. So you can do a startup and there's tons of support and network. And then there were some milestones on the campus leadership side where the campus made entrepreneurship a formal focus of the whole university leadership. So that showed up in our general plan about six or seven years ago. And then the campus hired, as you know, our chief innovation and entrepreneurship officer and made that a formal position. It's an associate vice chancellor position, so it really carries some weight. And it reflects that the university is really supporting the culture of startups and innovation. And then there have been some other important things, such as the Academic Senate has changed the elements for tenure in that entrepreneurship or doing a startup is now looked down on as a favorable thing for faculty that are applying for tenure. That's a big change academically. And then just lots of students saying, hey, I want to come to Berkeley because you have all these great startup programs. And that, of course, makes the university want to do even more because we're all about helping our students. Right. How people talk about how slow things are in that grand picture. I think what happened in the past 10 years at UC Berkeley is remarkable. And I think the reasons you mentioned are definitely high up there. A related question. Previously, when you're talking about deep tech, the influence is on big industries, big economies. Previously, the big companies used to work with universities through research sponsorships and so on. How is that relation evolving at this point? You know, how are universities going to play a bigger role in the evolution of technologies? So I think we're going to play a bigger role in that back in the day, there used to be these huge corporate research labs, Bell Labs, RNG Lab, Xerox Park, all of these things. Corporations are not investing in an institutional way the way they used to. And it's being more disaggregated around companies, for one thing. They're trying to make innovation kind of spread around as opposed to just at the lab, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But what that means is that the universities are now seen as institutions of commercial technologies that can go to the world, as opposed to what we used to be perceived of as we would make the discoveries in the lab and then we would hand it off to somebody else to go commercialize it. And while we are not in the business of commercializing technology, we now realize that part of how we fulfill our institution's goals of bettering society is to hand those great discoveries that we're making in our labs to people, maybe even on campus or other partners and get those discoveries to market quickly and be involved in that process. And at Berkeley, we're taking a really intentional approach to that where we're not only thinking, okay, we'll make them get to market faster. We're going, we'll take them to market. We have the founders, we have the faculty, let's help them do a startup. Let's help them commercialize the technology. Let's make the technology licensing really easy. Let's partner with venture funds. It's just a whole different approach. And as I mentioned earlier, is wonderfully complementary and supportive of our academic mission. Have you seen any 
evolution in terms of what how industry looks at academia now in terms of joint development and any example that stands out in a public UC Berkeley is number one public university and like it's a huge powerhouse. I'm trying to see like how industry outlook has changed in terms of working and if there are any innovations that came to the market because of that changed outlook towards academia. Yeah, well, certainly the hot technology is generative AI. Mm -hmm. And UC Berkeley is producing many of the talented minds. Some of our recent big winners in the market are AI companies like Databricks. Databricks, yeah. And there's no question that the venture community is looking at the startups coming out of Berkeley as on the bleeding edge of how to use this new technology, generative AI, AI in general, but now generative AI. And at Skydeck, we have companies coming to visit us. A company that came recently was Siemens. The CEO of Siemens came to Skydeck and it was really wonderful to see. He came in and we told him what we're doing at Skydeck. We gave him the whole overview of what we do. And he was really interested in meeting our founders. Like, let me see the startups that are relevant to Siemens. Let, let's hear what they're doing. And now they're in discussions with several companies from Berkeley that are very early stage who could maybe bring some real innovation to Siemens. So they're really looking not just at the labs, but at Skydeck, because we're not a lab, right? We're not doing discoveries and research. We're taking the founders once they've done that discovery and bring it to market. Yeah. I mean, that's phenomenal. The CEO of Siemens showing up and I was a postdoc and Bill Gates shows up outside the lab and he's talking about public health. The reason I'm bringing this, these things is because UC Berkeley is a number one public university, but it's also a powerhouse in producing startups. And these connections absolutely make a huge difference. And you might have mentioned it to other places, but the Skydeck is just not for UC Berkeley. It's welcoming other startups as well. Maybe you can lead that conversation there and then we can dig into deep tech. About sure. who it is open to. Yeah. Sure. So we are a university program. We're not a partner or an affiliate. We proudly support the, the UC Berkeley campus as a program of the Office of Research. So what does that mean? That means that we have a dual mission. We want to be the world's top global accelerator because we're Berkeley. We want to be the absolute best at what we do. That's very Berkeley. But also our equally important part of our mission is to support the public education mission of Berkeley. So how do we do that by being open to startups that aren't founded by Berkeley people, you might ask? Well, the same way the campus recruits brilliant minds from around the world to come and become students and join our academic community and bring their talent our accelerator program is opened to startups from outside the U.S. that want to come and launch here. Now, once they get there, what we enable them to do that benefits our campus and our students is tap into that campus system. So we help them look for student interns. So our students on campus get to be an intern for a company in market with a technology that has customers. That's really exciting for our students as opposed to just a project or having to drive an hour somewhere to get to a real company. They will just walk down campus and they can get to Skydeck. We also help pair these companies with our faculty to become advisors. And some of these companies end up renting or collaborating with labs on campus or equipment. So they become part of Berkeley. And about two thirds of our accelerator track are companies from outside the US. And then we have other programs that are open only to UC affiliates. Those are earlier stage companies where if you're a Berkeley student or Berkeley faculty, you've got a spot at Skydeck where you can work on your company. So we've come up with a way to bring that global talent from around the world and have them become Berkeley, become a Berkeley startup, join our campus and join our community. That is a great, great way of introducing the program. I'm smiling because you're able to bring talent from other countries as well. Maybe you can have a plug-in of like, the first thing that comes up to international inventors, if they want to come to Berkeley is like the visa, like how are you able to facilitate their movement? Because uh, that's a huge hindrance in this country. Right. So we can't grant visas to our founders, but they do on their visa application say that they've been accepted into our program. It is a requirement of our program that they spend time in the US. And so that formal invitation letter from the program they use for their visas. We, of course, have no influence on that process with the State Department. 
but we have found that our founders are able to come to our program with very few issues and fortunately are able to come and participate. That is such a huge help. I think it's such a huge hindrance and I think universities are going to lead that change in this country. On that note, let's slightly shift the gears and go into deep tech, a focus of my podcast here. You accelerate a lot of deep tech startups. In your experience, what are some of the common challenges faced by deep tech startups that differ from the traditional tech companies, like a SaaS company and others? Like, What have you seen and how are people navigating those? Yeah, so the sort of standard venture capitalist is looking for the next Airbnb or gigantic exit that's going to scale from two or three people coding away in their bedroom to a $50 billion company in eight years. Well, that's great. And we hope to find some of those, but we're also happy to support deep tech founders who need venture capital that is much more patient. So it takes a lot longer to fund a deep tech startup because they're probably in the lab building stuff. They have to buy materials. They have to test things. If it's a, if it's a life science company, we're talking about five years of maybe doing preclinical trials. All this takes time and money. And that's a different investor who's looking at a different time frame and a different profile for their investment returns. So we cultivate those investors. We look for those. They're in our investor network. Our fund managers find them. They find those companies that are willing to invest in, in companies building robots, doing gene therapy, building medical devices, all of that sort of thing. And it's a different type of investor and a different type of return profile. Very important for us to find those investors and we do. That's great help. I think finding those for individual founders is going to be a hard one. You have that power to do that. And I'm glad you're doing this. And maybe on that note, like what criteria do you prioritize when evaluating deep tech startups for acceleration and potential investments at Skydeck? Yeah. So of course, first of all, the technology, how powerful is it? How new is it? What evidence is behind it? And we're evaluating companies in every industry. We're in the middle of applications. We're just about to launch our big review process. I've started reading them. And if we come across a startup that is in life science or some sort of material science or building some sort of complicated hardware, aerospace. We have people in our network who are technically very capable of helping us analyze that technology. Is it solid? Is there enough evidence that this could move forward? And are the founders legitimately experts in this field so that we can be confident that what they're building, they're gonna be able to build. So that's incredibly important, number one. Number two, we need to get a sense of are the founders the type of founders who are going to survive that lab to market transition, which is kind of like going from the sea to the ground, right? It's like you need a different breathing apparatus and then your gills are not going to work on land. And that transition can go well and it can be difficult for some founders. So we try to get a sense of, are they really looking to go to that different atmosphere and turn this from a research project into a business. Hmm. Have you found any special genes in these founders that are good in terms of that transition? Anything that others can learn from? Well, I will say I have a great deal of respect for academic founders. I've observed over my time in the startup industry that those trained in the scientific method tend to be really good founders and have a really good head on their shoulders. And why? Because the scientific method, if you boil it down to a few sentences, goes thus. I don't know if this will work. Let me go collect some data. Let me make sure that I am completely unbiased and see what that data tells me. And not bring my own expectations, not bring my own biases, just see what the data says. That's how good founders approach the market. I don't know if my product's going to work. I'm going to test it with some customers. And it may completely violate my desires and wishes, but that's okay. I'm going to go with it. So the science founders who can make that transition, I find do very, very well as entrepreneurs. And yeah. you just have to sit and talk to them. And sometimes it's hard to tell <laughs> at that early stage how they're going to do with that transition. But I think we've gotten pretty good at sussing out that desire to make a business. And also I'll point out, there are the scientific founders that we accept a Skydeck early stage, and they know, and we know that they are not going to make that transition. 
but they know that somebody will need to be hired and brought in and they are okay with being able to hand over their baby to this business person or this new person. And that formula can work extremely well too. It reminds me of faculty founders. I know we have a lot of faculty founders. And again, that handing that baby is, is a difficult one. We've seen many of them. Any lessons learned in terms of faculty trying to start companies, what works and probably advice in terms of what not to do? I would say certainly for the faculty founder, Make sure that you've got someone with you on that journey, and it's probably your grad student. It might be your postdoc, but there's someone who's been working with you in the lab who can help you take this thing out of the lab. You can't bring in someone too early. You can't say, I have this great discovery from my lab. Let me go hire someone off of some sort of headhunter site. That's tough. More successful is Faculty and grad student say, we want to do a startup. We know that faculty is not going to quit their day job. They're going to stay as faculty, but the grad student is going to go with this throughout enough of a process that the company can mature to where someone outside the company could be hired to commercialize it. That's a good formula. That's a good one. I want to go back to something I was trying to get more information on in terms of evaluating startups, you know scalability and market potential come to my mind. How do you evaluate when you're trying to evaluate a startup on these two factors? I ask this because a lot of applicants want to fill that block of information. And how should a founder think about scalability and the market potential? Because these are like sometimes five, 10 years down the lane. Any advice there will be helpful. We encourage founders of any industry, it doesn't matter, consumer, life science, anything, to understand their initial market And that can be a not a very big market. In fact, if your first initial market is $10 billion, you're thinking about it all wrong. Mm. You need to think about who are those initial customers who will love my product. That could be a a $10 million market. That could be a very small market, especially for a deep tech startup. That might be research labs at certain types of universities, $10 million. But the founder can see Once I've tackled that market, then the next market is a clinical market. The next market is an institutional market or pharma. And I can kind of draw a line for how my product will move through those stages. But it's more important to understand the initial target market and how you're going to get to them because you'll figure out how you're going to get to those bigger markets much later in your startup's journey. Are there any founders who told a good story about this? Anything that stands out? Let's see. Yes. In fact, storytelling for deep tech founders is challenging. (laughs) (laughs) Painting a colorful picture, right? These people can't think too much about money because they never made any money. And then you're talking about a $10 billion, a billion dollar for that matter. If any story stands out, that'll be fun to hear. Yeah. So a software company comes to mind. If you'd like something really deep tech, a success story that we have for the Skydeck Fund portfolio is a faculty founded company called IOTA Biosciences. I'm sure you're familiar with that mm-hmm. company, Michelle Maharbev. Yeah. They went to market with a very narrow market and conquered that market. And then when they were acquired by a strategic, that path was much more clear, but this is a highly specialized product based on some pretty interesting research in Michelle's lab. And that acquisition. Oh, what was the timeline? It was really fast. It was fast one. Yeah. I want to say like five years or less. It mm-hmm. was rapid fire acquisitions, especially for something that was deep tech. Another one, because this technology is so interesting, I like to talk about the very early stage, but a company called Augmental. And it's not faculty founded, but it's a very smart Berkeley alum and his co-founder. They are making something called the Mouth pad, mouth, like M-O-U-T-H pad. And basically what it allows you to do is move the cursor on your device with your tongue. Wow. This is hard to do. Wow. Fascinating. (laughs) And who's their initial target market? Extremely disabled people. Mm. In fact, one of their early testers and design partners, very disabled people, paraplegics who couldn't move. Is that their end market? Absolutely not. Because once they've tackled this initial target market, which is obviously not very big, 
they could imagine a world where we're all walking around with something in our mouths and we don't even have to touch our devices anymore. That's the big, big vision. Great example. When it comes to deep tech, what I've observed is a lot of times the exits are M&A. Do you happen to prepare these founders any differently than a traditional startup where there's a better chance of you surviving or exiting by through an M&A? Is there any training that's going on there? Well, as I mentioned, it's a different type of investor. And with any startup, but especially with these deep tech startups, most of their journey is partnerships and working on pilots and then projects with strategics, large corporations, we're either research companies, drug companies, healthcare companies. And so they need to get really, really good at balancing the different needs of very different partners while they're doing clinical trials or device approval. Whereas your 10X, 100X, 1000X software company is just focused on a certain type of customer and building and thinking about how do I push this product out as quickly as possible? So it's a different pace. I wouldn't say by any means that these deep cut companies are going slow. They're not, but it's a different type of iteration. And it's really important that they understand the landscape of the companies that can buy their product. Whereas the software companies are just thinking about the customers that will use their product. And it's a different mindset. It is a different mindset. You bring up a good point. This is something that bothers me in terms of the time to market for a deep tech is much longer than a SaaS company, than a bike share company, and so on. With that in mind, what are your thoughts on acceleration times, like programming six months? Because there's no way they're going to hit the market in six months. How do you help them stay focused? Because I've seen a lot of deep tech companies go from one accelerator to the other accelerator, three or four of them giving up equity. How has your thought process evolved in supporting long-term startups like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So when we started Skydeck, it was really important to me to do the six-month program because most all our other accelerators, and there are some exceptions with deep tech, but many of them are three months and you just, you can't really do anything in three months yeah. except for polish off the pitch and introduce some investors. With six months, you can really dig your feet in. We have, as you know, our partner fund. So the Berkeley Skydeck Fund, which is thinking all day long, how do I help our portfolio companies? They help a lot with the post program. So two things. First of all, if you're with a program for six months, you can really develop some long-term relationships with both the Skydeck staff, our advisors, the relationships you make on campus. So you're going to leave the program with a much more powerful network that you can tap into. And of course, your fellow founders. And then the Skydeck Fund for the accelerator track for Skydeck, and we have different programs, but so I'm talking about the accelerator track. They're thinking about their investments all day long. So they're working with them for their next fundraise. We will have companies come to Demo Day to pitch if they have a new round open. So if you go to a Skydeck Demo Day, you'll meet the entire batch of the current batch but you'll also see a few companies who graduated a year or two years ago and they're coming back to raise a new round because the one they pitched at their demo day, they closed. An accelerator that really does a good job doesn't just run them through and say, bye, see you later, but they're permanently part of our community and part of our family. That's great. I want to go back to something you mentioned like earlier about partnerships because Skydeck is a UC Berkeley accelerator. In what ways is Skydeck leveraging its connections with industry partners? If any collaboration that came out of such thing, that'd be great to talk about. Yeah. So interestingly, corporate partners are, of course, are part of what we do. They're part of our revenue model. Since we're a program that neither teaches nor does research, we have to raise our own funds. That's standard practice for all centers on campus like Skydeck. And part of how we do that is partnerships with corporations and I'm really happy we actually just hired a new director of business development who's mm -hmm. going to be revamping our corporate partnership program, which we want to focus more on. She's a Haas alum, lots of background in deep tech. She's going to be amazing. And it's important to bring in corporate partners for two reasons. A, we need to bring revenue so we can rent our amazing Skydeck penthouse space and support our startups and hire people to support them and all that great stuff. But also because, obviously, these young companies want to meet large companies who want to do 
POCs, right? Mm -hmm. Like Siemens of the world and all these yeah. other. So we've had a few corporations invest in our companies, make strategic partnerships. We had a partner some time ago, Ford was our partner and they invested in one of our companies. That was a great partnership. We've had a number of companies from Japan as corporate partners, which is really interesting. We're doing quite a bit in Japan. I think we'll see more of those. And we also have a very active resource partner program. So these are companies, law firms and service providers who want to meet potential clients. And we have at any given time over a hundred startups in our program. You know, we turn that over twice a year. So 200 to 250 companies coming through Skydeck here. So companies like Brex and Carta love to come to our program and meet these young companies and get them on as customers in the early stages. Great list of partnerships there. Staying on the subject, building partnerships is a tough one for early stage startups. Harder for deep tech, I think. Anything that stands out in terms of good practices and not so good practices and things to avoid when you're trying to partner? To partner with corporates? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I'd say, number one, realistic expectations. So just because you've introduced a founder to a large company doesn't mean they go off on their merry way and then there's a beautiful rainbow colored <laughs> proof of concept study. The startup may need a lot of guidance for how to work with that corporation, especially if they're a first time founder, maybe they just got their PhD, right? Yeah. And they've never worked with the corporation. Getting a paid invoice from a corporation is a massive undertaking for any company. So we have advisors at Skydeck and their expertise is how do I help a young company work with this giant company for a proof of concept study? And when we see a founder working on that, we will send those advisors to them, like talk mm -hmm. to this person. And on the other side, sometimes the corporations need some education mm -hmm. about working with, with the startup founder. The terms can be interesting. <laughs> but the, the startup will get, I got this 20 page agreement and it says I have to hand over my firstborn child to this corporation. <laughs> Oh no, that's just a standard thing. You can go back to them and redline that up. So it can take some hand holding on both sides. And then timelines. These are young companies where three weeks is forever. Mm -hmm. And we tell them it can take you six months. <laughs> if they're lucky, yes. <laughs> it's just papered or nine. It's like having a baby, right? Yeah. Nine months and really painful at the end. And so the founders can give up. So we help them through that process. That is great help. Speaking of advisors, I know you bring a phenomenal group of advisors. Maybe you have a couple of stories about how they impacted a startup. They're talking to a new founder. Founders make a lot of mistakes. If any stories stand out, I would love to hear those stories. About how an advisor worked yeah. with a company? Yeah. So there was a company building a robotics solution to sort various products, and they had a large institutional retailer that they wanted to work with. And these are extremely technical people, brilliant people, really building a killer product. But the customer was in retail and that's just a whole different world. So what we saw happening was the startup and the larger company were sort of trying to do this giant project and we helped them narrow that down. The advisors help them narrow that down to, okay, you need to pick something very specific and very definable as a pilot to see if that works, which they did. And that worked out well. We also see the opposite where a startup is working with a company and the company is giving them like this pencil thin kind of project where you can only do this one thing and you can only do it for so long. And that's where we've had advisors come in and try to encourage that pilot and so working with the customer, the large company, to expand that a little bit and make the milestones a little less super defined mm -hmm. because it really should be seen as a learning process by both the customer and the startup, not as a, we're going to go prove this exact thing we can do, and then you're going to like us and pay us lots of money. No, you've got to learn about each other and see if you can work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Founders sometimes lose sight of what they can and what they cannot do. Just helping them focus is a great way to help them. Speaking of advisors, 
how should one pick an advisor, startup advisor? Because everybody goes around in the valley that they're a startup advisor. Any things to avoid? Yeah. So the good thing about being in Silicon Valley is there's a lot of expertise. The bad thing about being in Silicon Valley is there are a lot of posers. Mm -hmm. And they come sniffing around our accelerator all the time. They go sniffing around every accelerator. Let me, mm -hmm. let me be clear. So we tell startups, when you're looking at your advisors, and you should have more than one, obviously, you're looking at your advisors collectively to fulfill a few things. They could be just a generally very good and wise counsel, right? Someone who understands you, who gets you as a founder, who can give you good advice, not even necessarily understands your technology on a deep level, but who has seen this, you know, not their first rodeo, has seen things go off the rails a hundred times with other startups. And there's a lot of similarities. Life science startup can be exactly like a consumer app startup in terms of you're hiring the wrong person, you're thinking about it wrong, you're making a big hiring mistake. Or you really have to work on how you're approaching your customer, you're not thinking it through. There's a lot of these sort of commonalities. So see if you can find someone who's just willing to give you good advice. And sometimes that's what you want to hear. And sometimes that's what you don't want to hear. And from whom you as the founder will receive it. So that's one type of incredibly valuable advisor. And then depending on the company, you'll need expertise in your market. You'll need expertise in your technology. You might need this at different times. So think through strategically, what's my perfect menu of advisors? What do I need right now? And for some companies, it's like, I've got to prove out my technology. I really need someone who understands this technology and can guide me so that I'm collecting the right data, I'm doing the right experiments, whatever. Maybe you realize I really have no idea how my customer will behave. How do they buy? How do they find me? How would I meet their needs? I don't understand that. I need someone who understands the industry. So the first part is understanding what your needs are. Mm -hmm. But I would say most important, someone you get along with, right? Mm -hmm. Someone you have a good vibe with because these are people you're going to tell all your deep dark secrets to. And there has to be a lot of trust on both mm -hmm. sides. Yeah, I think you summarized them well. Self-awareness and trust, those are going to be super important. Thank you for that advice. And I'm going to slightly shift the gears and talk about one of the challenge for deep tech startups is commercializing. What kind of challenges do you come across when it comes to commercializing deep tech? These are long, long roads. And how have you worked with some of the portfolio companies, if any stories come to your mind? Yeah. So sort of the obvious conundrum of deep tech startup is that it takes a lot of time and money to build the thing that I want to show to my customer to see if they like it, where if it's software, you know, it's a couple of people coding for a couple of weekends, right? So the conundrum is how do I build this thing, which is costly without doing a giant investment of time and money and finding out that that doesn't work and voila, <laughs> no more. Yeah. So it's tricky. I would say definitely really important to have good advice. Really, really important. Someone who can help guide you through what your customer might want because you can't go show them your therapeutic or your medical device or your robot or your satellite because you haven't built it yet, right? So getting a really good understanding of is there a real customer here who's willing to pay for this is important and you're going to need help doing that. That's why that advisor network is so important. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can share some examples of successful deep tech investments you've made. You've done a lot, I know. And probably if you have identified, if you have do some retrospective analysis of that, if there are any key factors that contributed to those successes. Yeah, so one of the most successful companies in the Skydeck fund portfolio is an aerospace company called Skyloom. So they're making small communication satellites and when they came to Skydeck, they were quite early. And I'd say a couple of factors. We made a good choice picking them. What did we do right? And they made a good choice going to market. And I would say the two founders, they're from Argentina. We could tell immediately they were incredibly smart. I mean, you can kind of tell. And if you're building something in deep tech, you've got to have some 
really powerful brains behind it. They just do. It's a law of nature. <laughs> so we look for that. We could see that in the two founders. They then did a very good job of figuring out what the market would pay for and how they would use it. They were in, I think, maybe seven years ago. So the whole communication satellite industry at that time was still pretty nascent. And there were a lot of people doing a lot of things. So they did two things really well. They were really good at using their advisors to figure out how do I de-risk that I'm building something someone's going to want. They're very smart. So the technology they built was excellent. And then they were really good at hiring. So mm. one of the things that we see kill startups or maim them, <laughs> you know, maybe not fatally, but put them in the ER is a bad hire. You do one bad hire, you know, if you're a three person team and you hire someone terrible, it can be almost impossible to overcome. It'll That's take 33% of your company. Yeah. That's yeah. Bad. yeah, exactly. And so they were just very smart about their hiring and they got a lot of advice from the advisors about who to hire. And that's something that it's kind of overlooked, I would say, in the whole startup acceleration industry. You know, we talk about what's your go-to-market plan, your fundraising plan, your outreach plan, your research plan for deep tech. But just as important is, do you know how to hire? And do you know what to do if you've made a bad hire? Because that can kill a company really fast. And it will certainly make the founders miserable. And yeah. that's terrible. Yeah. I mean, these deep tech startups are hard. Like, what are hard for you to analyze when you look at a pitch deck? You must have seen thousands of them by now. Are there things that stand out hard for you in terms of analysis of like, is it a good decision or a bad decision? Any lessons learned yeah. from that? I don't have a technical background, but as we talked about before, there are certain things you can look for, whether you understand the technology or not. So... Right now, we're at the early stages of just reading applications online. And you're trying to make a decision based on very little information. We haven't even talked to the founders yet. So certainly for a deep tech startup, the background of the founder is incredibly important because as we talked about before, they got to be really smart to be able to build whatever crazy thing they're trying to build or whatever crazy science they're trying to do. It's hard. And one of the things we've gotten very careful about is making sure that if they're not from top tier university, they could be very, very smart. There's only so many positions at the Berkeley's and all the other giant right. top tier universities. And so maybe they're at a second tier university or even a third tier university. So it's harder to pick out the talent from that because they don't have the got into Berkeley, MIT, Stanford, Harvard, mm -hmm. right? Obviously an incredibly hard filter. So we look at who else is on the team. How cohesive do they seem to be? Do they have research publications? In what papers? How long have they been building this? Is there other evidence in their background that shows their technical prowess? Certainly time is very important. Like, did you start building technology in your industry two years ago? And that's not long enough. I want to see that you were focusing on this since many years before, even if you're a young founder. So that's very, very important. Once they come to Sky for an interview or Zoom, we do all our first round interviews on Zoom now, then we can ask the questions and start getting a sense of how well can they articulate what it is that they're trying to do. And of course, we get lots of founders from around the world for whom English is not their first language. Mm -hmm. We pay a lot of attention to what's behind the words, even if grammatically, it's not there. And we've had many great founders come to Skydeck whose English was really not well formed when they arrived in our program and have done extremely well. So you have to kind of listen behind the words for that. And it's a bit of an art. Mm -hmm. I was like, a bit of an art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's art. I'm just trying to get into your mind so that people are listening when they apply mm -hmm. at least things to do and not to do. Maybe a related question is, are there any specific areas or industries within the deep tech space that you find particularly promising or intriguing for yeah. future investments? So I love it all. <laughs> I love all the deep tech, bring it on, everything from life science to medical devices, robots. I love things that fly. I love new materials. 
that are going to save the planet. I love climate tech. We just announced our new and improved air and space track with three new track chairs. So mm-hmm. we're expanding that. We announced our climate tech track and we're looking for anything, anything. It can pull carbon out of the air mm-hmm. or help us make less carbon. So that's a really broad category. My startup was in neuroscience. So I always love reading those applications that are something to do with the brain, something interesting going on there. But we love it all. We love all hard tech and science. Good call. You're not picking any favorites. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Like, ask me <laughs> My children are at best. I can do it. Yeah. How do you differentiate yourself? They all have the accelerators and investors vying for the same talent. How would that pitch be of how Skydeck is special for a deep tech startup? Yeah. Good question. We have to compete. Yeah. The program. So I would say it boils down to a couple of things. Number one, you become a Berkeley startup. You join the Berkeley network. And that network, I would argue, there is no more powerful network than the UC Berkeley network. It's a strong brand, powerful yep. brand. Incredibly strong. Over half a million of us Berkeley alums around the world in every conceivable industry, all people who have been accepted and graduated from Berkeley. So highly competent, lots of experts. And connecting with the students on campus, 45,000, very, very talented and eager students. And then adding that network in a way where you can really dive into it, right? Six months of swimming in that network, you really make connections. And then what our founders tell us, in addition to that, they tell us that we're a very hands-on program and that we do a lot more than most accelerators. Our founders say there's more specialized attention. You know, our cohort is not giant. It's about 20 companies in the Berkeley cohort and about 10 in the Europe batch. It's not large. And there's a lot of customized programming for startup. The startups are matched with three key advisors that are with them throughout the entire time that they're in the program. So that's what we hear. They've told us we get more from the Skydeck program than we got from other accelerators we've been to. Great. Yeah, I know I can talk to you for a long time. I know you're busy as well. I want to make sure we bring this to a close by talking about the program itself. Can you share some insights into the selection process for startups? I mean, to Skydeck and things to do and things not to do when they're applying. Yes, because applications are open. I'm not sure when this podcast is going to go out, but applications are open through the February 14th. And then we might extend that a few days afterwards. So love to get those applications in. And here's tips I would say for filling out your application. We want a comprehensive view of your startup. You don't need to spend paragraphs and paragraphs on each question, but answer each question, give it some thought, spend a little time. If it takes you a couple of days to fill out the application, that's fine. We want to hear about your startup comprehensively because at first we're just reading. We're just reading the application. And tell us about your team and give us a sense of why you're so excited to build this company. At this early stage, we're investing a lot in the founder, in the team. Why is your team going to crawl through broken glass and all of those metaphors we love to use, but really put your heart and soul in this company because we're going to put our heart and soul into the companies that come to Skydeck. And we want to be the world's best accelerator. That's our goal. So we want founders that want to come and change the world. Excellent. And then maybe you can also plug in what founders will get once they get access to the program. For sure. Yeah, quite a lot. So for the Berkeley batch, they're going to get $200,000 of nice investment from the Skydeck fund for seven and a half percent equity. I will say that results in a 2.66 million valuation. If you've raised at a higher valuation and we in every batch have companies that have raised at a higher valuation, the Skydeck fund can change how that investment is given so that you are invested it at the same valuation. So we often have companies that come in that are at a five or even 10 million valuation pre-Skydeck. The year program is 100 and 45,000 euros for 6%. There is a program fee for that. And let me start with the Berkeley program. The Berkeley program is going to connect to the Berkeley network, be with us for six months in Berkeley, and then be presented at Demo Day to investors in Silicon Valley. The Europe program will be presented to investors in Europe. What they will both get is three key advisors, 
that are introduced to you through a two-sided dating process where you pick each other. Those advisors work for you pro bono during the program. You get workshops on every conceivable aspect of your business, and you get a community of very dedicated people from the Skydeck staff and the Skydeck fund that communicate with you on an almost daily basis about how to support you. And you get the Berkeley Network. Like I said, that's the most important thing. Who do you want to meet around the world who's a Berkeley alum or who likes Berkeley? And there's a lot of people who like Berkeley that want to help your startup. We can get you in touch with them. Excellent. This is a program that is very close to my heart because of my association at UC Berkeley for a very long time. And I highly recommend this program. Caroline, are there any topics that we haven't covered that people should know about Skydeck? Well, I would also add to that list of what do you get? You get an incredibly cool space. You get to oh, be yeah. the viewers. Of, yes, an incredible building. And you're in person. A lot of the program is in person. We think that's really important. Building community and relationships is part of what we do. And I guarantee founders will not only work really, really hard, but they'll really enjoy the experience of being in the heart of Berkeley and accessing everything we have to offer. Excellent. Great. Caroline, this has been fun. As I mentioned, this is one of my favorite programs for Deep Tech. I think we're just getting started. The bio program, we've talked about the bio, Make a Bio Hub previously with Vesh Kelly and Dave Schaefer and others. I'm super excited about what's going to come in the next 10 years. And good luck with everything. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Arash. Great talking with you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Lab to Startup podcast. You can find links to the resources and programs mentioned in these episodes, connect with Naresh, or subscribe to this show at labtostartup.com.